It's the Bob McCowan Podcast, brought to you by Bet Rivers. Download their online casino and sportsbook app today. I'm Bob McCowan with John Shannon, and this is the McCowan Podcast. We uh, we lost a uh, a member of the broadcast family uh, yesterday. Bob Cole was 90 years old, the longtime play-by-play voice of uh, hockey in Canada on Hockey in Canada. And I guess in many ways, he did more Maple Leaf games than anything else. So perhaps we should consider him a Maple Leaf broadcaster. Oh, I think there'd be people across the country that would take claim to Bob Cole at some point, uh, uh, Bob. Uh, People in Edmonton uh, have an affinity for Bob because he called their first Stanley Cup. People in Montreal, where he did probably earlier in his career more games than he did in Toronto. Uh, would lay claim to him. And I think I, I think you bring up a really good point. Uh, Bob Cole uh, really wasn't affixed to one team. He was the network voice. He was the guy that, even if there wasn't a Canadian team... You're not the- wrong, John, but he the games he did were made Leafs for the most part. For about 15 years, yeah. But he did the, he, he worked for 40. So for there was a period of time after Bill Hewitt and before Jim Houston that he was the voice on Saturday nights uh, in Toronto. But he, you know, you know, this was I, actually I was amazed yesterday of the reaction. Bob hasn't done a game since 2019, hasn't done a, a Stanley Cup final for 15 years, uh, and the country actually took a pause yesterday to uh, to remember him. And I think that uh, it speaks to what he did as a. Uh, as a broadcaster uh, on a on on hockey night for for oh so though many years, so we're gonna we're gonna just take some time, talk to two or three of his uh, old cohorts, uh, and uh, pay tribute to the man I view as the voice of hockey night in Canada, Mr. Bob Cole. Back after this. Hi, this is Bob McCowan for BetRivers.com. Hey, if you're looking for a sports book or casino app. You should check out the Bet River Sports and Casino app today. Play all of your favorite casino games for real money anywhere and anytime. Plus, get in the action with each sports game with hundreds of sports betting options. And get ready to feel like a VIP because you'll earn both loyalty level points and bonus store points on every real money wager you make. You must be 19 plus, available in Ontario only. Please play responsibly. If you have questions or concerns about your gambling or someone close to you, contact Connex Ontario at 1-866-531-2600 or speak to an advisor free of charge. BetRivers.com. Welcome back to the podcast, Remembering Bob Cole, joined by John Davidson, the president of Hockey Ops for the Columbus Blue Jackets, who joined Hockey Night in Canada in 1984. And got to experience Bob Cole full throttle in a few years, uh, right, John? Yeah, I'll say that's a that's a that's a loaded statement. It was something else. It was fun. It was uh, interesting. It was intimidating. It was all of the above. Maybe the best part was uh, with yourself and myself, and Haji, and a whole bunch of guys. It was a traveling road show too. We had fun. We had a lot of fun. Not only did we do the games, but we had fun. Yeah. Bob, uh, everybody has routine. Uh, you, as a goaltender, you had routine. You sat beside Bob, who had routine. Um, what was that like in the booth? Um, at first, it was intimidating. And then it took some time, and then everything fell into place. I can remember uh, vividly my first ever game for Hockey Night. You, you and I had been working together in Calgary and Edmonton, and then some Hockey Night came along. and So it was uh, my first game. Hockey Night in Canada. I'm working with Bob Cole. The night before, I stayed in a hotel near the uh, Maple Leaf Gardens. I don't think I slept an hour. I was nervous as hell, just petrified. And um, got into the uh, to the game, to the booth, and uh, Bob's there, and he's he got a game face. It's one thing about him. He was almost like a player. He, he got his game face on to, uh, to broadcast a very important Saturday night across Canada game. And um, 
I remember him that we stood up for the national anthem and he wasn't saying much to me. I was the rookie and I mean rookie. He took the lineup card, took a, a tack and put it in the wall right beside where his, where his head was. So if you had to look, he could just glance and there it was. So he sat down and he undoes his belt. And I'm sort of sitting there looking, okay. And then it just, you know, just sort of makes everything really comfortable down there. Then I figured out down the road that he, he, his voice was so booming and it was, he got so excited that he needed that voice to come right up from down there and right out his mouth. So nothing got in the way of his diaphragm or anything else. So, so I'm sitting there, first game of Hockey Day in Canada, first game of Mr. Cole, and I'm watching this. And I'm, okay. So anyway, the game starts, and he had the headset with the mic, and he had one hand on the, uh, on the earpiece over his ear. The other part was up here a little bit, and then the mic. Yeah. And he starts, and the game's going, and he's up and down, and his veins are coming out a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, and next thing you know, it's a commercial. And that's fine, except for I haven't said a word yet. Okay, that's good. So then pucks dropped again, and it's, you know, it's this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and I get in Canada, and we'll be right back. Second commercial, I hadn't said a word. <laughs> I mean, it's not even been there. So I'm saying to myself, I got I to gotta do something. So he drops the puck again, and uh, that, that, down he goes, and he's going. And I tapped him on the shoulder to say something while I startled him. And he jumped. And the headset kind of went like this, and he put it back in place. And uh, this is how you can count it right back. I'll tell you, mister, don't ever do that again, he said <laughs> to me. And, you know, I can't blame him because he was just at work doing his thing. Right. And so we got through that game. We got through another one a weekend or two later. And then we had a third one in Montreal. And I was still the rookie, green, green as hell. And... Um, we, we finished the game. We went into I can't remember if you were there or not, but we went downstairs to the bar in the hotel and he liked his Captain Morgan and I, I was going to have a, a beer, a Molson. By the way, that's un, un, unflavored Captain Morgan. Is that Captain Morgan dark? That's no, right. Dark no rum. flavored. You, couldn't, you right. couldn't bring anything other than Captain Morgan oh, dark. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I go, hmm, okay. And yeah. so uh, we're sitting there and uh, he's having and I'm having. And he says, you know, Big John... I said, what's that, Bob? He says, just talk to my wife after the game. She said, you and I are really good together. Really good. From that moment on, I was in. Yeah. That's that. I had to pass that test. It took three games. His wife approved. And he and I were, we were good. We were, we were good with each other. It was fun. I learned a lot. Obviously, with Bob, you know, Bob and Harry, Harry Neal, they were a great pair all those years. They were, they were an institution. But I had the pleasure of working with Bob. I learned uh, about his traits. And certainly, there's not many people, and I, I don't care what sport it is, there's not many people that can get, can get to, a, to a climax as the puck's near the net. Just the puck going down the ice, and he gets a little more excited. And he knows something's happening, and he gets more excited. And it, it was just, it was a fantastic uh, listen, for sure. You probably answered this, but... Uh... It is said that Mr. Cole uh, would not want his commentator, yourself in that case, to talk while the play was going on. Is that true? Yeah, I found that out, yep. <laughs> <laughs> when I tapped him on the shoulder. Yeah, he, he, was, he was old school in that way, but, but he was, I, I understood it because he was so into the game and so concentrating and reading it and understanding it as the play went on. So it was my job, especially as a young guy in the profession, to learn to adjust to something like that and, and deal with it and work with it. And, and uh, he deserved it all. You know, I, I worked with other guys too that were like that, like Dan Kelly was like that somewhat, the, the older broadcasters. And John can attest to it, times have changed. And it, one of the things I think that changed all that, Bob, was, um, was um, in, in football with John Madden. John Madden became the, the analyst became as 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 not necessarily as important. Well, he became bigger than life, but the analyst became more prominent because I think of his work as time marched on and everything evolved. Right. How how, how much do you think Bob knew about the game? I mean, lots of there's lots of play-by-play -play guys that do the game but don't know the game. How much do you think Bob knew the game? You know, I, I don't think. If he did, he didn't let you know it because that wasn't his place. His place was to call the game. 
Right. And, I, and when we'd sit down and you were there a hundred times in restaurants and dinners and things like that, he, he would never say, can you believe that power play? Why don't they have this guy on there? Why don't they have that guy on there? That, all of us were doing that. He didn't do it. And, and no, I think he knew his, I, I have a saying, know your seat on the bus. And I really think that he knew his seat on the bus and he was really good on the, in that seat. The, the other amazing thing about Bob, uh, John, and you, you experienced it firsthand too, was he, he, he built great relationships with people. Uh, and, and I'm not just talking about us. Um, our friend Wayne loved Bob mm -hmm. Cole. Yeah. Sid Crosby. It, it, um, Glenn Sather. Yeah. There, there was something about there was something about Bob and the trust that athletes and coaches uh, gave him uh, yeah. in these situations that he wouldn't compromise that friendship, would he? No. Not at all. You know, you when you mention people like that, they're at the top, right? He was at the top. And they have an understanding that, you know, we all go through life if you're at the top or whoever these people are. But you got to learn to trust people because you can't trust many. You just can't. It doesn't matter who you are. Somebody's going to try to get you or whatever. To this day, in, in uh, I haven't talked to Wayne for a little, little bit, but he still calls uh, Bob Mr. Cole. Wayne Gretzky yeah. calls him Mr. Cole. And, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, Sid the eastern part of Canada. Bob was a very, very proud Newfoundland. Very proud Newfoundlander. But he, yeah, he had a way. And and he wasn't a gossip guy at all. You know, he, he, he and, and he, had, he was, as you know, very strong in his opinions and his stubbornness in that, in that aspect. But that helps make him who he was, how good he was, and why he was good. He's a fascinating individual. I, I was thinking about it last night. You know, you, 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 you're the one that told me a few days ago that, uh, you know, he was slipping a little bit, and uh, so I called him and left him a voicemail, and uh, I didn't quite know how to get into it, but I, he's a big Yankee fan, huge Yankee fan, and I said, hey, Bob, Yankees out of the shoot, 10 and 3, man, we're going to have a good summer, it's going to be good, and uh, I know you Canadians are going, well, why didn't he like the Blue Jays? He liked the Yankees before there were Blue Jays, Yeah. and uh, he's a very loyal man that way. And but I, but I was thinking last night. I said, you know, there's a, a lot of things that happen in life. But if you really dissect Bob's life, and you know a lot more about it than I do, in his youthful days, he was a boxer, and uh, he's supposed to be a very good boxer. And that came out sometimes when we talked to him. He was a tough, stubborn guy. You know, he you know he, he I, it wouldn't take him long to drop his gloves. I can tell you that. But don't you think it would make a fascinating documentary of the life and times of Bob Cole, how he grew up in Canada, what he did, what he became. It'd be, it, it was a great Canadian, in my opinion. So I, I think that would be fascinating. Which is why he has the Order of Canada. Yeah. You know, there you it, go. Be, yeah. Beyond being a, a Foster Hewitt Award winner uh, yeah. for and, and as having a, have a little profile in the Hockey Hall of Fame, he, you know, people in this country felt strongly enough of him. They nominated him for the Order of Canada and he won it. But, yes. And by the way, that and, and there's another part of Bob, because we all think of Bob as this blustery guy and bigger than life. Um, but when it came to talking about himself, he hated it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and so, that, so he, so yeah. you know what I found out about, he got the order of Canada the day after they gave the award. <laughs> and I said, well, why and, didn't you tell anybody? Yeah. He says, well, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be bragging about it. I didn't want to be telling people that I've, I've got yeah. something special. And then, you know, and, and yet he carried that, he, you know, part of the deal is you, you wear the lapel pin for the rest of your life. And, uh. Bob, you always saw Bob with his Order of Canada pin around. Yeah, you know, it was fantastic. He, uh, when he went into the hall as uh, the foster here, the broadcasting wing, it was big. You know, there's a lot of other people that go in there that, yeah, it's nice they're in. When Bob Cole went in, it, it, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. It was so well-deserved and because of who he, who he is and who he was. You know, there's another lesson to be learned here, John. And I think you're the one that is the best at it, way better than me. And that is make your phone calls, talk to people because uh, father time, father time's undefeated, hasn't lost yet. And we're all going to go, but you reach out to people that are getting on an age, you know, there's, there's a lot of them. And that's something that should resonate with people like myself and others. Make sure you go out of your way a little bit more just to make a five minute phone call and say, well, and say, how, how are you doing? And things good. And because sooner or later, they're not going to be there. They're, they're gone. And you're going to be kicking yourself in the ass because you didn't make a five-minute phone call. I'm told that Bob Cole 
uh, regularly went down, was at the arena at 10 in the morning on a game night. And he would go and talk to players or coaches or general managers or whoever was around. Did that influence you? Did you do the same thing? Had to do it. Had to do it. He, he, I wasn't very good at, uh, I have bad memory. Yeah. Bob, Bob, Bob had one thing in mind when he went down to the morning skates. And that's because it revolved around his job. He wanted to know the lineups. He wanted to know who was in and who wasn't. So he could have his lineup sheet tacked right, right beside his eyes. And, and uh, some coaches don't like doing that. They don't, I'm not going to tell you who I'm playing or not playing, especially in the playoffs. But they, they, they did because they knew that he would not compromise that. He wasn't going to get on a radio show or call his buddy and say, hey, Wendell Clark's not playing tonight. Or Dougie Gilmore is playing tonight. It's a big surprise. He was very, very good at that. And also when he, um, when you reach that status in our world of hockey, when he walked in, it's Bob Cole. He walked in. People would pay attention and and uh, and uh, and talk to him and say, you know, you, you, it's amazing how if you're polite and you pick up things, you might be able to weave it into a broadcast. But yes, certainly I learned. I, I had to do it. My memory was so bad. I also had to write everything down. <laughs> I had to file things that I that, that I learned. Or if I learned ten things, I might only remember three of them. But Bob, Bob just did it the right way. He didn't compromise. He didn't ask too much. He didn't. He didn't try to be in, uh, invasive whatsoever. And then, it, you know, it turns after that. Sometimes the coach knows he can trust you. Say, come here, I want to talk to you. Yeah. Scotty Bowman was like that. When Scotty trusted you, he'd say, hey, John, come here, I want to talk to you. You know, things, it was great. <laughs> it was great. Actually, it's funny. When you, when you, when you mention Scotty's name, there are people of that ilk. Scotty, Dick Irvin, Harry Neal, you know, and Bob's in that conversation. Bob's always oh, yeah. Bob will always be in that conversation. Oh yeah, talked to Scotty the other day. He's sharp as a tack in his nineties. I mean, he yeah. is razor sharp. Yeah. But you're right. There was it's changed a little bit because um, there's so many more people in the broadcasting field that it, it's just a little different. You don't you not you don't get used to people like you get you, you yeah. did before. In my opinion, yeah. in the states it's it's different. You can have Sam Rosing doing play by play for the Rangers for. 30, 40 years. Yeah. Uh, Vin Scully for seemed like a hundred years doing the Dodger games. They're, they're, those, those types of broadcasters are in those cities so much longer than the players and coaches that the yeah. people that's, that's, that's your glue. That's your conduit. It's, it's interesting. Before we let you go, do you ever get the Heisman? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> that's it. Stop. Yes. yes sir. <laughs> Bob would, uh, just for everybody, Bob would, something would happen on the ice and Bob would have a flair for what's going to happen and the crowd yeah. was going crazy and he would stick his hand up just like the Heisman Trophy to every <laughs> color man that he ever worked with and get the Heisman. And that, that too was kind of a, that was a a term of endearment in many ways for Bob Cole. Oh, yeah. He, got the he Heisman. was right. He was right. Yeah. We didn't even get into the late night stuff. Oh, we used to don't even go. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you the Heisman there. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks for this, John. Anytime, guys. Good time. Thanks, to you. All the best, Bob. Thank you. See you, John. You too. All right. John Davidson in Columbus. We'll be back remembering Bob Cole on the McCowan podcast. Welcome back to the podcast, a special edition remembering Bob Cole. Uh, there's only one man uh, that has actually produced Bob McCowan and Bob Cole, and that is Mark Askin. Uh, Mark joins us from his uh, abode in the state. state. I didn't say that. Uh, if in uh, north of the city, uh, Mark, yes. uh, first of all, your thoughts on uh, the passing of uh, an old friend of ours, Bob Cole. Um, I, you know, a lot of things have gone through my mind. Um, most. Most of it is stuff that the fans will never see. Uh, most of it is, um, is, is just how, how Bob was not, uh, he had an unbelievable personality, but you never saw it on television because Bob was so buttoned down and he was such an incredible friend. Like I, I can't even put into words what, you know, what, what he meant to, to young people that were starting. Mm -hmm. And if he took, you know, Johnny, you, you had him before I did. 
but I'll bet you when you first were working with him, you're like, wow, like this guy is all business on game. As long, game. As, long as I got him his can of Coca-Cola, yes. Yes. And also, <laughs> also, uh, do like he he hated meetings, hated them almost as much as grapes did. So he told me two things when I first met him. Yeah, Coca-Cola was certainly one. Yeah. But the, the, the second one he told me was, if I ask you a question, don't guess. For instance, he said, <laughs> last year I had a producer who I asked him what the score was in Montreal and Detroit the night before. And he said, I think it was 3-2. This is the second thing he's telling me. And I don't want to know I think it was 3-2. If you don't know, don't say you don't know. So that was two. The last one was, and this is what made him so charming, and people need to know, you were not allowed to talk in his ear when the game was on. And I mean not even enough to tell, as a producer, letting the talent know when you're going to commercial. You were not allowed to say commercial on the whistle in his ear. So he told me, Mark, do not talk to me. His line was, Doug Beforth once told him commercial on the whistle on a breakaway, and it drove him nuts, and he never trusted him the same way again. And I said, mm -hmm. well, we're going to try to change that. So I will have the AD in the booth slide you a card. So when Bob went into the Hall of Fame in 1996, we were talking to a bunch of people, and I was there with Coley. And Coley said, you know what I like most about Mark? He never told me we were going to commercial. I thought, oh, my God. Of all the things we've done together, you remember that? And it was just, that's how he was. He cared about, he wanted every show to be perfect. And many nights he he did. So those are the things that are running through my mind. Also, Donnie, going to his golf tournament mm -hmm. in Newfoundland, which for me was my first time on The Rock. And I would have been uh, 30, not, not even that. And he... He was adored there. Bally Haley, we all played at Bally Haley, although we spent a lot of time at the hotel bar and I don't drink, so I heard everything. And uh, you'd have every person in hockey wanted to come to this golf tournament. And you'd be sitting there. I'm a Bob knows better than anybody what I was like when I started because I was just a little kid. And uh, but you'd see these people coming through, and Coley held counsel with everybody. And the smile on my face watching him with his native Newfoundlanders has run through my mind. I know that's a lot of stuff. Yeah. It's funny because it's the the, things we had uh, we had Brad Gushu on, what, two weeks ago? Yeah, uh, about that. And, and by the end of the conversation, guess what we're talking about? The we're talking about Bob. We're talking, we're, no, we're talking about Bob Cole. Yeah. And, yeah. And, right. and, and Brad, and of course, Brad and Bob had curling in common. Right. Right. And and that was and you could see it on Brad's face as a Newfoundlander, what Bob Cole meant to him. Yeah, yeah. It, it he uh, my goodness, I, 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 Johnny. I'm going to say this. In in my view, and I know, well, I think I know what you're going to say too. He was the goat. He's the greatest of all time. He wasn't just the guy of this uh, generation. We'll never have another him. And it was an honor and a privilege to do yeah. games with him. It really, really was. He was hockey royalty in in the in the in the booth. I mean, I, it, it, like you, it, I said this yesterday, and I, I don't know if I explained it properly to somebody, but I always thought when I was doing a game that Bob had been here before in this exact moment, in this exact moment, because there's no way. You could time these calls perfectly unless you'd seen it before. He made the first time we all saw something legendary. He did it all the time. Very few guys came down the wing and scored. He knew somehow that Rick Vive, Guy Lafleur, when they came, they're going to score or there's going to be a heck of a play here. He never missed it. He never missed the moment. No one laid out better than him. Maybe no play-by-play -play guy I ever worked with um, 
was the maestro. You never said, why isn't he talking? You knew why he wasn't talking. He never missed a moment to make the moment better. Yeah. There you go. It's, it's funny because um, Bob was a, a such a great communicator. He was a master of the pause. Oh, yeah. As the other oh. Bob, the guy who's with us, was the master, is the master of the pause. And right. there is something to be said for that, right, Bob? How to communicate by not well, saying Well, I never anything? thought much about it, but uh, when it was brought up to me that I occasionally pause to think about what I'm going to say... Um, I agree. I think it, it's an impactful thing, but it was not something that I did deliberately. Yeah. And I suspect Bob Cole didn't do it deliberately either. I think you're right <laughs> at times. You're right That's at times. The- but he, but as we, as we talked about with JD, Bob, um, you know, Bob knew the moment. And as to Mark's point, if the place was going wild, what what better communication is it than the crowd roaring than two shut up, right? Time? Just shut up. That's right. Yeah, and Bob it, said Bob. Bob actually probably didn't say it as politely as that at times. So, yeah. oh no, that's true. <laughs> yeah, like, like here's the thing. Um, now, for people that don't know, there are minute and thirty commercial breaks. But in the old days, it was thirty second commercial breaks. Right. So you had time during a commercial to set up what you wanted to do. So I would say a lot of times, come out a break, you can give me one line or nothing, and in a playoff game, in a big playoff game. There's nothing better than taking the person that's watching the show and taking them as close as you can to the to 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 the event. Coley did that. I think that was paramount in his mind. The other thing he did was he made the stars if they could have been bigger than they were and that respect that went both ways between mm-hmm. him and 99, who called him Mr. Cole, and Sidney Crosby called him Mr. Cole, and these great players who, when he walked in the dressing room, I'm not exaggerating, he never he never had to wait for their attention. They came to him. I've never seen that before. Well, so, they, it, grew, they grew up, Mark. They grew up watching Bob Cole, right? 100%. 100%. I remember Alexander McGillney once told me that uh, when he was in Buffalo, he'd hear this guy doing games, and he'd just come over from Russia, so his language wasn't too good. But he said, Mark, he would say things, or the, the, the power of his voice is what he said to me. I would be starting to, like, really leaning in to see what that was that he right. was talking about. This is a guy who came over and probably – you know, never spoke very much English until he was maybe 20. Yeah. And yet he got cold. Yeah. And the, the players adored him. Right, Johnny? I mean, oh, yeah. the, 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 the guys he talked about, like <laughs> Wayne, uh, like to me, to see Wayne just be almost kid-like giddy talking to Cole. And Coley really appreciated, like, he, he wouldn't say it, but he's going, this is, this is the effect I had. So it, it's absolutely amazing. So, the, so before we let you go, um, the pinnacle for Bob and you, the '93 conference final. Yeah, I, I think so. Well, the whole playoffs, right? Um, the three seven game series for the Leafs, because he did uh, all he did all three of those series, correct? He did all three of those series at twenty one games and forty one nights. Yeah, that's the other thing with Cole. Okay, one other thing. I know you got to go, but let me say this, please. Take your time. He was. The king of sleep. Nobody, <laughs> we used to call him Rip Van Winkle. He was asleep. One time I remember we had two days off between uh, games in a playoff series. So after the night, we all would go out somewhere and uh, Coley would have the, the captain. And uh, he's, I'd say to him, what are you doing tomorrow? Mark, it's, we got two days in between by I'm going to get a lot of sleep. So then we went to the skate the morning of the game, which is the next time any of us saw him. Yeah. And he come over to me, Mark, you won't believe it. 33 straight hours I slept. It was great. And I put another 16 on yesterday. And it was with pride, (laughs) Johnny. Oh, sorry. You've just tweaked me to two quick stories. You were were involved in one of them. 
Okay. Uh, and it's it, it's 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 tip it's classic Cole. But the first one was um he loved the TV show Dallas. Oh yes. He loved the TV show Dallas. Yes. And so it and that one ran on CBS at 10 o'clock on Friday nights. Yes. And Friday nights we were, you know, usually out. <laughs> uh, you never ever got Bob out of his hotel room at 10 o'clock on Friday night. He had to watch it. He also had he also had to have the world's longest uh sit in the bathtub. Uh, he loved to have his tubs every every game day. How so do you know that? Well, he would tell you. John, oh, don't no. be calling yeah, me. Don't sure. be calling me at noon. I'm gonna be in the tub. Okay. <laughs> so 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 no, so but here's oh, so, Mark, so and Bob rarely came out for dinner with us. Yeah. But but you and I and about eight other people, we went for dinner at uh I want to say uh a steakhouse in New York. And we got talking about great events. Do you remember this? Yes, I do. And you told the story, he says, guys, last summer, trip to Rome. I'm a good Catholic. The Pope touched my forehead. And it it it, it was amazing. The Pope touched me. It was amazing. And Bob turns, I'm sorry to tell this story. You should probably tell it, but I'm going to tell it because it was so good. Bob said, Mark, I got something better than that. <laughs> so everybody perked up, says, How could, what could be better than touching the Pope? And Bob said, we went to a concert at Madison Square Garden. Frank Sinatra. Sinatra walked in, walked down the aisle right where I was sitting, reached out and touched the lady next to me. That's exactly correct. <laughs> but he he just he loved Sinatra so much. Oh, that that was to be that close to Sinatra was as good as being touched by the Pope. Well, and people were looking at him going, "What, Frank Sinatra? Mark just talked about the Pope." Yes, that's right. That's right. Yes, I remember that. Oh my oh, gosh. God! The thing, well, the it, thing is, we could you know, for the last thirty six hours, all I've been doing is talking to people about Bob Cole, and every time we talk, something new comes up because you remember another story. Oh, it, 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 and that, that that's why I started this by saying I wish people knew. Yeah. Uh, the, can, can I leave you with one funny story? Because Coley was not the best ad libber when the game wasn't on. He just he he wasn't. So one night, uh, this is in the early '90s. There was a mine disaster. They felt it was a mine disaster. It was going on in Kirkland Lake. It was on the six o'clock CBC News. I had seen a bit of it, and Ronnie Harrison, the late Ronnie Harrison, God rest his soul, came in to the truck and said, "Mark, what, during a commercial break, Mark, have you uh, did you see the news tonight? I I did. Is this about the the mine disaster? Ronnie Ronnie says yes. We should get Coley to uh, uh, to say something to a great hockey community that Canada from coast to coast are thinking of you. I said, give me the next commercial break. We play, go to commercial." I go, Coley, did you see the news tonight? What? What, Mark? What? Did, what? I said, wait. Dick Duff, <laughs> it's true, just called Ronnie, Dick Duff, a former Leaf from Kirkland Lake, and would wonder if we could say something, really, to make the people in Kirkland Lake realize that Canada is thinking about them. 15 seconds back. What kind of a mine is it? I said, it doesn't matter, Bob. It's just a mine. It's a mine disaster. Can we just say five, four, three, just say something for, from Canada to them. Hello, you people out there. I know it. It's a tough night. Kirkland Lake, great hockey community. Puck goes down on the ice. The play's going on, and you can tell Coley doesn't know what to say. Right. Well, and you people, and you know how important hockey is. There's a breakaway. He can't. And he says to me on a button called the talk back where he can only talk to me, which Colt, which Johnny, you know, he never used it. He hit the button and said, I can't get out of this. <laughs> and, and he was so frustrated. Meanwhile, beside him is his other uh, Muppet brother, Harry Neal, who has got his head on the desk howling with laughter. And Harry says, 
takes a piece of, and funniest person, am I right, Johnny? Maybe ever in the moment. Yep. Yep. Writes out a piece of paper. Also, Bob, report that two guys are stuck in a car at Young and Eglinton and <laughs> slides it to Coley. So Coley goes, here's Benning over to Vibe. Ho, 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 and laughed on the air. That was Coley. He and Harry had that incredible, but you could, like, he just was so regimented to the game that anything that wasn't pure that, he he didn't do as well as he could. But then he came to me later and goes, that was important. I could have used more than 30 seconds of that's right. notice. Well, that, that's what he needed. He needed uh, something other than the game. He needed to prepare. Absolutely. He really did. So anyway, I love thank you. Uh, thanks for this, Mark. Nice oh, to see you, Mark. You too, buddy. Great always to see you. Talk to you soon, I hope. Mark I'm Askin, up. former producer on Hockey Night in Canada, remembering Bob Cole. Back after this. You know, Bob, uh, uh, Bob Cole was, he was one of those guys that when we were doing the, the regular show primetime, particularly on television, he was a, he was a regular listener and a viewer. Well, and every- it's interesting. I was going to mention, John, Bob Cole came in studio one time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember if you were there or not, but, uh, it was, we did it because he was promoting his book. Was he? That's right. I think. Yeah. Anyway. He was so nice and so complimentary to me. Yeah. But he said to me at one point, you know, I watch the show all the time. Mm-hmm. And that's, it's, it's interesting that that affected me more than anybody saying anything. Really? Yep. Because you never think about who might be watching. Right. You know, and I certainly wouldn't have put Bob Cole in that position. I wouldn't have thought he would watch prime time every night or, or often but he oh. did and he was so nice he was a, a wonderful gentleman i wish i'd spent more time with him well i uh i knew the man 47 years yeah you're lucky and, you and uh i i you're in you're mm-hmm. bang on uh the pleasure was always mine to deal with bob cole he he, he it's funny just just as one personal aside um every time we chatted on the phone and the last time was early this month uh he would always ask me about my kids not everybody really? does that and no and i he, understand he he would always say how's jake and he had he had remember jake from meeting him when jake was eight years old well jake's 34 now yeah that was the kind of guy bob cole was anyway Appreciate you doing this, Bob. It means a lot. My pleasure. To me. Enjoy and, it. Uh, it was. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's a tough couple of days, because uh, we lost a legend in Bob Cole. I hope everybody enjoyed the discussion. Thanks for listening and watching the McCallum podcast. It's the Bob McGowan Podcast, brought to you by Bet Rivers. Download their online casino and sportsbook app today.